Tonight we are going to have the open discussion I feel is appropriate who Jesus really was. Was he black? Was he white? Doesn't matter. And we are, have invited and are blessed to have three of our brightest minds to address this issue from different vantage points. We will have a 15-minute presentation by each speaker. Then we will raise our offering because, as you know, we have a major march this week, and this is the end of the year for the network, so we're going to raise money. You can start getting that ready now. And then we will come back and have a question and answer period from the audience. To host and moderate tonight, though, such an, uh, uh, such an occasion, we felt it would be appropriate to ask our pastor, who has been one that has stood head and shoulders above others in the field of theology and in the field of political activism, who has not only been our personal family pastor, but has pastored this movement for better or worse, for him anyway. It's been better for us. At times, it's been worse for him. So we're going to bring to you who will host this evening the eminent pastor of this great church, Dr. William Augustus Jones, Jr. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, thank you, Reverend Sharpton. Uh, this promises to be a rather uniquely interesting experience this evening. I have never known uh, Christology to be discussed in such a forum. This is a new experience. You've come tonight to talk about one who came to a world where he already was. <laughs> well, I, I'm not a panelist, but uh, that's that's what we've come to do, and uh, we have uh, we have three outstanding presenters. You know all of them quite well. And Reverend Sharpton has laid down ground rules. They will come, uh, each man in his own order, and speak for 15 minutes, and then uh, you will have opportunity to participate in a giving mode, and then there will be a period for questions and answers. That's the format. That's the law of the Medes and the Persians with respect to our discussion here tonight. Uh, welcome again to Bethany Church, and uh, let's, let's get this show on the road. Now, uh, Dr. Clark is here. We're glad to see him tonight, and uh, Dr. Walker is here. And Bishop Rogers is here. Now, the lead-off witness will be the Reverend Dr. Wyatt T. Walker, the Harlem preacher, Renaissance man, and he'll be followed by Dr. Henry Clark, uh, our uh, historian uh, with portfolio, and then Bishop Huey Rogers, the leader of the Bible Way uh, Worldwide Church Movement, will uh, speak in third in, in third order. Uh, Dr. Walker, you ready? Well, let's roll. Come on. <laughs> Good evening, my brothers and my sisters. My friend William Augustus Jones said that John Henry Clark was a historian with portfolio. I suppose I'm the historian without portfolio. Uh, I do hold an earned doctorate in African-American studies with a specialization in music. 
I don't know whether Jesus sang or not, but I know he's made a lot of us sing. Amen, lights. And I'm from over there from Harlem. I know I'm in the High Baptist Church at night, but it would encourage my heart if you said amen once in a while. And if I don't say anything that warrants an amen, I'm not doing so well to say, help him, Jesus. But say something. I, I come out of the tradition where speaking and preaching is dialogic. I think that's the word. I get my big words from Bill Jones. What color was Jesus? The color of Jesus has no intrinsic theological significance. It is an issue of some significance because of the erroneous and misleading images that have helped to buttress the persistent view that Europeans are superior to all other peoples of the world. It needs also to be discussed for the sake of establishing the historical accuracy of the person we know as Jesus of Nazareth. It is as important to know the ethnic makeup of Jesus as it is to know that Napoleon, who was Corsican, was neither French nor Filipino. First, let me be precise and submit to you that the question put to this panel is not altogether cogent. There's a question in my mind as to the correctness of verb tense. For me, the question is more appropriate of what color is Jesus? The theological underpinning of the Christian faith is our confident belief that Jesus equals God. He is, according to John's gospel, the eternal logos. That is present when the whole creation got up off the ground. We believe that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the first begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. For confessing Christians, the question is, what color is Jesus? To be sure, if the question is narrow to the issue of ethnic identity on the basis of anthropological data, then we may inquire what color was Jesus. But that narrows the discussion to the time frame roughly between 4 B.C. and 29 A.D. when the carpenter from Galilee lived in biblical Palestine. The former issue is moot because God has no color or ethnicity, not even gender, in spite of what some male chauvinists believe. Our ancestors in the brush arbor and cane break were theologically sound in spite of their preliterate circumstance. He's my father, he's my mother, he's my brother, my sister too. Let me begin at the beginning. The dawn of creation was, according to the best evidence of the Leakeys, the leading archaeological anthropologist of this century, Adam and Eve's home, the Garden of Eden, was in sub-Saharan Africa. Thus it can be deduced that all of the people of the world began in our ancestral home. The families, tribes, and nations that occupied the Horn of Africa and what is now called the Middle East <laughs> are the direct descendants of Aboriginal Africans. Those people are classified as Hamitic or Semitic. No present-day Europeans are included in either group. Despite their strong protests, Despite their strong protests, our Jewish brothers and sisters are in the same family that we are in. <laughs> Moses and Aaron are familiar examples, although I could make a strong, strong case for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if we knew historically who they were. Moses and Aaron will suffice for now. You will remember that the people called the House of Israel spent more than 400 years in the land called Egypt. Its real name is Kemet. The Europeans messed up the name. They had somebody, some leader who named Egyptos, who they wanted to honor, so they changed the name of our folks' land from Kemet to Egypt. It got transliterated into Egypt. I just thought I'd slide that in there. <laughs> 
Joseph, who you remember, went down and interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams. And in response to the interpretation about the famine and so forth, the Pharaoh gave Joseph the daughter of an African priest. That meant she was a black woman. Yes. He had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. When the children later on got to the promised land, they had a, a, some land distributed to them on the basis of being the two sons of Joseph. I told you Jews was colored. <laughs> then let me talk about the baby in the bulrushes. The daughter of the Pharaoh was there. And I want to remember you, remind you that the people who occupied Kemet or Egypt as it is known popularly were people who were on the low scale of the color line. They were dark skinned like Bishop Rogers. Yeah. yeah, they were black. See. If you go up the Nile and visit the Valley of the Kings and Queens and the Grand Temple of Luxor and see the images of the people, they got the flared nostrils and the big lips like you and me. Yeah. So the people who were the indigenous people of Kemet, of Egypt, were black folks, not medium colored like Bill Jones and me. We are the result of somebody going down into the slave quarters after the sun went down, don't you see? So the daughter of the Pharaoh goes down to bathe in the river. She sees this cute little baby in the bulrushes who was abandoned by the mother because there was an edict that the Jews were multiplying too fast. You know that story. It happened to us in the Caribbean, see? So they wanted to kill all the boy babies. The mother loved the baby, so she put her at the spot where she knew the Pharaoh's daughter took her back. And she saw this cute little baby who looked like her and fell in love with it and took it back to the palace. That's why she took Moses out the river, because the baby looked like she looked. Moses was black. They ran me away from New York Theological Seminary because I taught my students that Moses was a nigger. They couldn't stand that. <laughs> But if you live somewhere 400 years, you are what that country is. And Moses and the children of Israel had been in Egypt, Kemet, for 400 years. They were Africans. Then, you know, he got in trouble. He killed a man about the absence of justice and fled into Midian and married the daughter of the Midian priest, who was also black. See, I mentioned in passing about now known as the Middle East. There ain't no Middle East. It is an extension of the continent of Africa. It's really a part of our home out there, and that's something European. They call it the Middle East. Ain't no such thing as the Middle East. It's the bridge to Asia, between Asia and Africa. And so Moses became a product of the culture and nurture of Egypt, what had been his home. Now, he had to lead this ragtag bag of ex-slaves out into the Promised Land, they spent 40 years trying to get themselves organized. See, so you don't need to be dismayed about sometimes that we all not get. It takes time to get folks of color organized, see? And while he was out there, you know, he went up into the mountain, and the, the tradition is that uh, they got the stone tablets and the lightning. You know, if you follow the Hollywood bit, they got the Ten Commandments. Now, those of you, and I know some of you up on it, the Ten Commandments are ten of the 39 negative confessions which were in Egypt a thousand years before Moses got there. If you need a, a reference, you look at C. Wallace Budge's The Book of the Day. Yeah, somebody got it right there. You can look it up. Back on page 380-something. 39, and, and 10 of them are exactly like the Ten Commandments. Now, the point I make, it doesn't matter whether he got them up in the mountain or whether he smuggled them out of Egypt because he knew he had this challenge of mobilizing these people, they still ten good commandments. Doesn't matter where they came from. But their origin is in the culture and nurture of Egypt where the people who look like you and me live. Now, his brother was Aaron, as you know. I'm going to try to make this 15-minute business. I'm gonna his grandson was named Cushy, which is a diminutive term for somebody named Cush. 
And all through ancient lit literature, particularly the Masoretic text from which we get our most accurate translation of the scriptures, Cush means he of the burnt face. Now, I mean, you, you don't have to be a nuclear scientist to figure out what that meant. That meant he was black. Now, if Aaron's grandson was black, Aaron must have been black. Yeah. And in the eighth, sixth, seventh, and eighth chapter of Leviticus, you will see where Moses sets Aaron and his sons apart to the priesthood of all Israel, which means the whole priestly line of the Jewish nation were black. You got it. You follow the genealogical tables as outlined in the book by my friend Walter McRae in Chicago, Illinois, the genealogical tables of the Bible and the black presence in the Bible. You will see that the uh, mythical story about Noah and Ham and all of that, but if you trace the genealogical tables, if you want to go that route, you come right on down to Boaz. And Boaz, you come right on down to David. And Jesus was of the line of David. Case closed. <laughs> and when, when they got to the promised land, they ran into the folks who had an agricultural economy named, named the Canaanites. In the last 27 years, I have been to the land of the Bible 28 times. So I speak with some expertise. In Jericho, the oldest inhabited, continuously inhabited city in the world. Somebody has lived in Jericho for the last 12,000 years. And the descendants of the original people, the Canaanites, are still around Jericho. When we get off the bus, some little nappy-haired black kids come up speak no English, they speak Arabic, they are the descendants of the original Canaan. You can see the women walking up and down the street, black as coal, the original Canaanites. Now you know they got in trouble with God because they intermarried with the Canaanites, not because of race, but because of their idolatrous practices. You have to keep that in mind. There's nothing wrong with the race that the Canaanites came from, it had to do with their practice. God hates idolatry whether it's a 450 SESL or a Jaguar XJ12. God hates idolatry. Help me, Holy Ghost. Now, I'm almost finished. I have come now, and I wanted to build my, my foundation on the Jesus question. I took you from Ham and Shem down to Boaz, and from Boaz to David, and from David to Jesus. In biblical studies, we rely somewhat heavily on what we call the internal evidence of Scripture. It is similar to the clues that are available in the literature of the Negro spiritual about how our ancestors perceived slavery and their response to what they perceived. It is more accurate than the external evidence, which is usually that what someone sees from the outside looking in as an observer. In the same wise, we trust what is contained in the record of Scripture as over against what someone 2,000 years later may set forth in commentary about Scripture. Hello, somebody. Let me talk about this Jesus fella. The lineage I have already mentioned. Now, angels are the messengers of God. It can be presumed... And I think we could agree that angels must know what they're talking about since they are dispatched by God with their messages. Is that right? The angel came when Edict, Herod the Great, not Herod Antipas, Herod the Great, issued the edict to slay all the babies under two years old in Bethlehem because he heard that's where the king was, new king was coming and he didn't want to be upstage. The angel told Joseph, take the mother and the baby into Egypt and hide them. You can't hide no blue-eyed blonde baby in Bedford Stuyvesant. In the first century AD, the people who inhabited Egypt or Kemet, they were black people. Hello. That is what the internal evidence reveals. Now you go over to the book of Revelation and it describes the Lamb. Hey, John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the summer of 93, I stood on Patmos Island where John was in. Be there revealed unto him what's going to come at the end of time. That great eschatopiece. 
at the end of the New Testament. It describes the lamb. It says his countenance was like burnt bronze and his hair was like lamb. Whoa, yeah. Now, to further support, I do not want you to think Jesus was like a sore thumb sticking out in biblical Palestine. When you read uh, chapter 13 of the book of Acts, it says that the leaders of the church there was one Simeon who was called Niger. <laughs> now, come on, you know what Niger means, don't you? That means black. Yeah, in our colloquial, we start somebody, hey, Sam, what you doing? You know, they know, you know he's a brother. Simeon, who was called Niger, and the other fellow was from, uh, well, I better look at it. And when you get to be 65, you can't remember every detail. <laughs> Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. Do you know where Cyrene was? Africa. You know, Simon the Cyrene who helped Jesus up to, up to Lucius, that had to be one of us. <laughs> With the diaspora from Jerusalem following the crucifixion of Jesus and the persecution of people like Saul of Tarsus, the center of the New Testament movement of the early church was in Antioch. The leaders of the church, two of the three, was brothers. Simeon, who was called Niger, Sam, and Lucius of Cyrene. Now, one more reference, two more reference. Apart in, in uh, Acts 18 and 24. Yeah. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. Do you know where Alexandria is? Alexander is in, in Egypt, and Egypt is in Africa, and the people at this time were black people. Here's this black Jew born. I told you Jews belong to the same family. An eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This, is, this, is, this, is, this guy was already preaching before Paul got to Ephesus. Then listen, this is the one going to blow you right out the water. And I'm through. 21 and 38. You know, Paul came back from his third missionary journey. He collected the offering for the saints. And he got involved in a riot at Jerusalem because they thought he had taken a fellow named Trophimus into the inner court. Out, let, him, let him get past the Gentile court. And they whipped on him. They mugged him. And then they called him before the Roman captain. And when Paul spoke in Greek, he that guy, he said, how are you speaking group? He said, I'm a Roman citizen. How did you buy yours? He said, I'm Roman born. See, and then in the course of the conversation, he says to him, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago raised an insurrection and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Now, if he's looking at Paul and he thinks he's an Egyptian and all the Egyptians at this time are black, what do you think Paul looked like? Now, the point I'm making is that the people who surrounded the venue in which the religion of Jesus developed looked like him. So he must have been way over on the color line. The issue is clear and the conclusion transparent. Given the historical context of the life of Jesus and venue and the culture of his time and that of his contemporaries, by North American standards, Jesus must have been colored. Before 1963, he could not have been able to ride on the front of a bus in Montgomery or eat at a restaurant in downtown Birmingham or have the right to vote in Selma. Looks like we're airborne. Uh, yeah, we up above the clouds. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Dr. John Henry Clark. Wow. Dr. Stephen Grant.
right, right, it's your left. All right, Bob. That's the same. I'm pleased to be in this church again. You will discover soon after I get started that I'm not here to win a popularity contest. And I'm old enough and secure enough not to care. My curiosity and a great grandmother who was a cultist Baptist led me to want to teach Sunday school at a very early age. So before 10, I was teaching the junior class in Sunday school. My great grandmother was a deity to me then. She's a deity to me now. When I looked in the Sunday school text, especially the illustrated history of the Bible, and found no one that looked like my relatives, I began to suspect that someone had tampered with the book. I asked my grandmother what had happened, why we are not in God's book. She said God was love, God was kind, God was no respect of kith and kin. And I asked her about the curses in the book. I began to see that the Bible was not only a racist document, to some extent, it has a lot of spicy pornography. This whetted my curiosity about who wrote the book. Then I began to dig deeper and I noticed that all the angels were white. <laughs> you cannot tell me that God is love and God is merciful. God is no respectful, respect to kith and kin. And he didn't let one little brown or black angel sneak into hell. <laughs> I ain't buying it. So when I finally came to New York, where I could use the public library and where I had access to a lot of unemployed great teachers, Arthur Schomburg taught me the interrelationship of African history to world history. Willis N. Huggins of the old Harlem History Club taught me the political meaning of history. Hansberry taught me the philosophical meaning of history. And that great Caribbean cadre, Richard Moore, and the works of Hubert Harrison, taught me how to question history. I began to raise certain questions, not only about the Bible and how my people had been omitted from the Bible, but how it had been omitted from history itself. And I learned one thing about not only history, but about religions. Man's greatest spiritual hour on this earth was that period in history before the formation of organized religion. Before the formation of organized religions, man, especially in Africa, had created societies that had no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. No orphanage, no insane asylum. 
Now, somebody from a thawed out icebox in Europe <laughs> would dislocate society, declare war on culture. He would not only colonize history, he would colonize information about history. The most disastrous of all of his colonization, he would colonize the image of God. He would infer and say, you do not have the right to approach God except through my conception and my permission. What I'm saying is that all members of organized religions who justified slavery through that religion, who justified unkindness with that religion, therefore making God ungodly, therefore making themselves atheistic in relationship to religion. And to be close to God is to be away from them because they made all of them into male chauvinist murder cults. The African did not have a religion or a culture where he separated the man from the woman. She not only got equality, but she's got respect. When her position was different, it was equal in its significance. Now, you cannot approach this subject with hearsay. I am mainly a classroom teacher. Although I've held many administrative jobs in the school that was a bore, my greatest hour in education is not as a chairman, not as assistant dean. Before that classroom, watching those eyes come alive as I pour out information and make it significant for them so they can become different and better human beings, giving them the strength to challenge that world out there and meeting them 20 years later, better human beings. Now, even for a short talk, I reviewed a few references and when you're a teacher you become a willing slave to references not hearsay the folklore of the Old Testament Sir James Frazier a book that it took me almost 10 years to find a copy when I finally find, found it all I, I found a student who borrowed a copy from the library, shipped it to me so I could Xerox it, and I shipped it back to him so he could dig it back in the library before they missed it. <laughs> Called Roman Africa. This book shows how Christianity entered Europe directly from the North African church. Oh, yeah. This was never a European religion. Oh, and it is not now. And that after the conference at Nicaea, when those semi-illiterates and misguided bishops fashioned that religion to suit Europe, made it a male religion as against both fee fee male and female, and they did not understand whether Christ was male or female, when they deliberately lost the books of the Bible that they didn't want to deal with, especially the book of Mary, because they could not create the Immaculate Conception if they left that book in the collected books of the Bible. 
because in Africa, Immaculate Conception has nothing to do with whether a woman has a child by man or not. Because you can see in Africa, you see a woman with nine children. If her reputation is good, if her, she's only going with the man or men she's married to, she speaks the truth, an African would say that her skirt is clean, her mouth is sweet. She speaks the truth. She is virgin. He means virgin in reputation. This was before people began to create fairy tales and they began to copy other people's teaching stories and to personify those stories as though it happened to them. Stories about the river cross, hard to let somebody out. Look, they walked into Egypt. Why did they, couldn't they walk out? <laughs> now, I've consulted John Jackson, one of our finest writers on religion, lived and died without getting any attention from his own people. John Jackson, pagan origins of the Christ myth. He traced the Christ story through 26 civilizations a thousand miles apart. Every civilization has its own Christ story. Every civilization has its own creation story. You know the Hebrew version, and that's the one you think should be universal. You've got to be a sinner or a fool if you don't know that. That's only one creation story, one Christ story. One thing the Africans were noted for, and should read also the, that section of the Book of the Dead, which said that no man has the right to judge or condemn the gods of another man. Now study the African and the Arab occupation of Spain from 711 to 1492. The Africans never the Catholic Church. The Africa never destroyed Spanish culture. The Africa never did to other people what has been done to him. My main point here is that spiritually the world is safe in our hands. It was never safe in the European's hands. I will not argue about the color of Christ. It didn't matter until someone made it matter. When he rose, the only European type people in the area where he was born, according to the legend, were Greeks and Romans. So never argue his color. Just establish the fact, was he a Greek? No. Was he a Roman? No. Conversation over. So he had to be one of those other people, and all of those other people was a variation in color. All of them. Western Asia was an extension of Africa, and this is outlined in a very good little book. It's in, even in paperback, University of Chicago, Phoenix paperback, when Egypt ruled the East. You want more information on it? It's, it's in a book called John W. Baldwin's Prehistoric Nations. One of sister who wrote an excellent work on it, Ducilla Dungey Houston, The Wonderful World, the Ethiopians, the Wonderful Ethiopians of the Kushite Empire. There's no lack of information. Then read John Jackson, one of his last books, Christianity Before Christ. 
then read a book about Alvin Boyd Kuhn, Shadow of the Third Century. It tells you what St. Augustine said about the conference at Nicaea. So these people make me laugh. They're trying to give us a religion we had 3,000 years ago. <laughs> what was Alvin Boyd Kuhn talking about? <clears throat> he was talking about the undogmatic, unformulized, communal Christianity that existed before farmers, bakers, and fools gave it a name and began to use it for the imperial domination of Europe over other people. He was talking about pure Christianity because along with pure Christianity came pure socialism, pure communism. Yeah. <laughs> to each according to his needs. I wish people, instead of arguing the point, read some of the serious literature on the subject. There's a good body of serious literature. Ben Yarkin is the African origins of the four of the three major Western religions. John Jackson, again, man, God, and civilization. Alvin Boyd Kuhn's Who is This King of Glory? Really one of the best books on the Christ story. Joe Massey's work, Egypt Light of the World, two volumes, but especially Joe Massey's classic little essay, The Historical Jesus and the Mystic Christ. Now all of my research about the fakery of religion have not taken me away from spirituality, have not taken me into jail, hasn't destroyed my morality, hasn't destroyed my respect for great moral preachers, and I know some, and hasn't, respect, hasn't destroyed my respect for the Baptist church in which I grew up in, although I know it is the loudest and sometimes the wrongest of all religions. <laughs> And yet I've got a love affair with growing up Baptist that I will not let go. Those singing bees and those eating contests and great preachers and my uncle who was a spellbounder known to turn every sinner from the mourner's bench and who I sat on the mourner's bench one time and he refused to convert me and grieved about it the rest of his life. Of all the people, he couldn't bring to God. Twenty years passed before I told you more worried about your reputation than my soul. <laughs> what I'm saying that we need to understand before Africa was spoiled by foreigners and fakers and fools. African spirituality tried to bring man in harmony with nature. The African knew, but a whole lot of people still don't seem to know. You can't make a hurricane and you can't stop one. You can't make the ocean roar you can't make it keep quiet. Once my students asked me, inasmuch as you are against all organized religions for the crimes they've committed against people, where do you think you're going to go when you die? I said, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to stay right here. What do you accept as your personal God, Savior? Maybe the same one as you, but in a different way. I live out what I believe in. I give a portion of 
my earnings to different people and different causes. I don't have to be prodded into it. Nobody have to write me a letter to tell me to do it. I love my people. I serve my people. I give out information free of charge. I endow libraries. I'm a good example of a Christian. I will always be critical, and I'm ending now, of the misuse of religion, politics, and culture. Man rises and falls within the framework of institutions in no other way. When we lost the concept of institutions, we became imitators of our oppressor. We were in a trick bag, part of our own making, part of our oppressor's making. And once we understand the European has nothing to offer to our city, he created our problem, we have nothing to offer to the solution of that problem. If all the documents disappeared and you left one, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. You can make it through the world just on that alone. We need more talks on this. We need a whole talk on the so-called Ten Commandments. Because they weren't commandments at all. And if Moses brought them down from the hills, he had to take them up there with him. Well, I'm knocking at the door of 80 now. I've had a great love affair with my own people. In such a way, I have a great love affair with all people and all humanity. And being a good human being also being, in spite of my criticism, being a halfway decent Baptist. <laughs> A decent Baptist. <laughs> Confession is still good for the soul. And now we're going to hear from a halfway decent Pentecostal, <laughs> the presiding prelate of the Bible Way Church worldwide, Bishop Gary Rock. <laughs> God bless you, good evening, and praise the Lord to everybody. We honor the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that is black and African, and to Dr. Jones, a great pulpiteer, a great man of God, and to my friend who invited me, the Reverend Alfred Shopton, who is a mighty man of God. Uh, Dr. White, you walk us, stirred our soul here today and gave us information and inspiration. Dr. John Henry Clark suddenly challenged us and gave us a provocative message. Uh, and I'm here uh, as the last speaker of the evening, and uh, I'm trying to get into the thinking of uh, Reverend Shopton. He invited a scholar of history and a great historian and a Pentecostal preacher. And uh, we've heard marvelous explanations and certainly wonderful teaching. And I'm thinking that when I invited Reverend Shopton to give a lecture during Black History Week on last year, he turned around, took the Bible, and preached and stirred our very soul. So I've come back to repay him for 
all the damage that he did while he was at Bible way. And so I think, brothers and sisters, that we've gotten a lot of information and I'm going to give you some more, but I feel like at a certain time in our worship and at our deliberation, we ought to take some time to celebrate. And God has made us a happy people, is that right? Not naive to the point where we don't know what's going on, but we can take all that the enemy tried to give to us and still survive. Black people are a living witness that God is real. Uh, we've had some great leaders in our time, and we thank God for Martin and for Malcolm. And we thank God for all of those who God sent us to take us higher. But I go back to an old psalm that says, if it had not been the Lord. I wish I had a few Pentecostals. We have intellect. She think I'm going to preach it. Uh, we have people that have built civilization. But I would submit to you that the wisdom that we've got, we got it from the Lord. I would submit to you that Jesus is not only black in skin, but he's black in experience. The Bible says that uh, when Jesus came preaching and John had one of the same questions that we have here tonight, John was in jail. You know what that's like, don't you? <laughs> Folk will put you in jail for talking about the real Jesus. Folk will put you on an island and in a burning cauldron of oil if you talk about the real Jesus. Well, let me say to you that because there's a real, there must be some fakes around. I heard Dr. Clark say that there's fakes and fools. But uh, David said the fool has said in his heart, I ain't got no help here, that there is no God. And so our faith is in God. And as a people, it's been the Lord who has been our strong tower. And I know that folk have messed with uh, the image of Jesus. Uh, uh, even history tells us that even in the Roman Catholic faith, that in Poland, where the present Pope comes from, if you look in the back rooms of the cathedral, you'll see the black Madonna and the black Jesus. Not that they were copies, they were original. And I submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that not only was Jesus the original, but you and I are the original man. I didn't bring my notes, but I feel my health. The Garden of Eden itself was in Africa. The cradle of civilization was in Africa. And I want you to know that we have no reason to go around thinking that we are inferior. We have no reason to go around thinking that we are second class. We are first class because our God is first class. The God that I serve is not an assistant God. I wish I had me a half a Baptist picture. The God that I serve is not a vice God. He's not a junior God. But the scripture says about Jesus, in him dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead body. Everything God is, Jesus is. God is eternal and Jesus is eternal. God is light, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
And I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that David, who was a black man, and they wanted to pass over Brother David, but Samuel anointed him with the oil. And David said, I want to build a house for the Lord. And, and the Lord said, I would have you to build, but you got blood on your hand. And so the Bible said that a, a man by the name of Solomon, I became king. And when he became king in the book of the Psalms of Solomon, there was a man, a quotation there, that had to do with the courtship that says, I'm black, but I'm comely. In other words, I'm black, but I'm fine. Hallelujah, I feel my help here now. And so, out of the tribe of Judah, out of the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus came. He was born. And they took him down into Egypt. And the Bible said, out of Egypt, I call my son. I hear the book of uh, uh, Psalms said that Ethiopia shall stretch forth the hand of God. We didn't get our religion from the United States of America. I feel like preaching now. We didn't get our religion from Calvin and Spurgeon, but we got our religion from the Almighty God. Say yeah. I think I'll go ahead and preach now. The Bible said, a evangelist by the name of Philip was uh, riding and going back from a worship service. And uh, then when he was going back, an uh, uh, Ethiopian, a uh, black man like me, could I preach a minute? Uh, I was driving in his chariot. He was the treasurer of all Ethiopia. And the Bible said while he was driving that he heard the scripture. He was wounded. Y'all don't get me. For our transgression. And he was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And power. His stripes will heal. Say yes. Well, that, that Ethiopian, that man that was on the chariot, he said, what does hinder me from being baptized? Want to be baptized, you see. Lord, have mercy. And Philip said to him, said, he said, he is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? Went on down in the water, came up, uh, amen, converted, saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Went on back over to Africa and preached the gospel. So when they came over on the slave ships, they could say, we are saved. We know the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Not because the white man said, Jesus is Lord. Not because the white preacher said, but he's Lord. Because I know him. I know a man from Galilee. If you're in sin, he'll set you free. Ah! Do you know him? Do you know him? I got to quit. Because my time is up. But can I talk about Jesus? Can I talk about Jesus? Revelation said, John said, I was in the spirit. Could God Almighty. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Said, I didn't put him on a microscope. I didn't put him in a, a, a psychology book. But I saw him in the spirit. Said, when I saw him in the spirit, his hair looked like lamb's wool. Eyes like balls of fire. Feet like polished brass. Jesus, the lily of the valley. Jesus, the almighty God. Alpha and Omega. First and the last. Beginning and the end. Shake somebody's hand like you go shake it off. 
and say he's black and he's coming back. I got to quit, but stand up on your feet and let's celebrate. Stand up on your feet and let's praise him. Say yes. Why don't you say yes? Can I preach? Should I preach? I got to preach. Cause the charge to keep I have and a God to glorify. Ever dying so to save it, fitting for the sky. I know who Jesus is. Yeah. I know who Jesus is. My grandmother down in Vidalia, Georgia introduced me to Jesus. It wasn't the sharecropper, but my grandma told me who Jesus was. I said, Grandma, who is Jesus? She said, he's the same one that brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He's the same one that delivered Daniel from the lion's den. He's the same one that stepped in the furnace a long time ago with three black boys by the name of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and brought them out. Say yes. Shake somebody's hand like they go shake it off and say he's black and he's coming back. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. What is he going to look like? When he comes back again, put your arm around your neighbor, say he going to look like us. He going to look like us. If you're looking for a man with blonde hair and blue eyes, you ain't going to stop. But John said his hair looked like lamb's wool. His voice was like a mighty water. Say ya, say ya, say ya, yeah. Hallelujah. My time is up and I got to quit. But I want you to know that Jesus is real. The reason I know he's real, cause I once was lost, couldn't find my way. Jesus showed me a better way. I was lost, sinking deep in sin, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my distressing cry. And from the waters, he lifted me. Safe am I, amazing grace. Oh, y'all done stopped on me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. His name, I wish he didn't help me with his name. I said, what's his name? I said, what's his name? I said, what's his name? And at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Every tongue must confess. Every white knee. Every black knee, every brown knee, every red knee, every Baptist knee, every Methodist knee, every Catholic knee, every Islam knee, I've got to bow at the name of Jesus. He's black and he's coming back. Bishop, you and Rogers. Enjoyed thus far. Dr. Wyatt T. Walker. What's up? Dr. John Hendrick Clark. And Bishop Huey Rogers.
One of the things that we wanted to display, my pastor, Reverend Jones, always says that the blood that binds us is thicker than the waters that divide us. And we wanted to show tonight from different vantage points of our community, we're not as far apart as we think we are. And if we just talk more to each other and relate more to each other, we might be able to heal the wounds in our community and move further toward progress. I saw a whole lot of nationalists saying amen tonight. I saw a whole lot of church folks saying he's black and coming back. So I think it's already been a good evening. We're going to go into question and answers, but I'm going to raise the offering first. Because I know some of y'all get nervous keeping all that money in your pocket. And this is our end of the year rally. We have to pay off our deficit for the Action Network. Join me quickly. We're going to make a special presentation from the network. Reverend, Brother Luther Gatlin, the president of 100 Black Men, will you stand with us? Stand with us. A few weeks ago, as you know, I went to Indiana to see Mike Tyson. Right. And Mike, you know, grew up right here in Brownsville and has always been one to remember his community. And as we were talking, he kept going back to the fact that the world always seems to demonize those people in our community that try to represent something that is of progress and empowerment. There have been those that have covered many frontiers. One of the frontiers that we have not covered very well has been the business frontier. Right. We cannot ever call ourselves free until we are economically independent and self-sufficient. Right. One of the men that has fought in that area and has taken a many a brick and brack for it has been Brother Don King. <laughs> Don King not only built a business but took an industry and they have not forgiven him for that. He made people that had never been out competed in anything look like sheer fools in comparison with his business acumen and his way of doing things. He took the wisdom of the streets mm -hmm. and conquered corporate suites. <laughs> and every year he has, for the last 30 years, given gifts to the community around Thanksgiving time and Christmas time and other times. I was there when he gave ANC $100,000 long before Mandela got out of jail. All of our organizations he has given monies to. He has been there when no one else was there. And he always put his money where his mouth was. So we wanted on tonight as we do our season's greetings to give something back to him because he always comes to give to us. And he, as you know, again, they're trying to accuse him of wrong. But tonight, we're giving him the community's indictment. He stands accused of making young black men millionaires. Right. Yeah. He stands accused. He stands accused of breaking down a segregated sports industry that only wanted us to be the performers and not the bankers and not the counters and not the business people. He stands accused of upholding dignity and pride and standing by his fighters and by his clients when no one else would. He stands accused of taking the largest concert tour in the history of show business and put it in the hands of the parents of the artists 
with the Jackson's victory tour 1984. Don King does stand accused. He's accused of excellence, of diligence, and commitment in our community. Let us give our salute to Brother Don King. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton, and all the distinguished ministers and bishops. And Huey said he's black and he's coming back. Ah. <laughs> I stand before you humble and submit myself to you, the community from which we come. I am very thankful and appreciative for the award, the recognition. I'm deeply grateful to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who has carried me through. I've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word, and he's never failed me yet. <laughs> it's been a long day for me today because we've been feeding the hungry, the poor, the underprivileged, the downtrodden, and denied. In a ritual that we have done, and Mike Tyson has joined me, he sends greetings to each and every one of you. We had a conference call with Mike yesterday, and while we are trying to pacify him, as you know, it's very difficult talking on the phone, and every two minutes somebody come on and say, you are talking to an inmate, and this phone call will be terminated in two minutes. And instead of uh, we trying to find things to say, that's John and Roy sitting back there, the co-managers of Mike with myself, and all Mike was thinking about is some lady in Houston who was trying to feed the hungry. He said, we want to find that lady. Is in this, uh, what is it, John, the Kids Care? Kids Care Incorporated. What's the lady's name? Carol Porter. She's a, he's seen her on television, and she was trying to do something for the Houston area kids and while we were talking to Mike because he wants to come home you know and and every, every word we trying to say about what the lawyers say and what the judge may or may not do he say find that lady in Houston and give us some turkeys to feed the poor. Ah. So today we added her to the to the team Tyson turkey tour and we feel very good about that, but that's how God works in mysterious ways. It's one is this to perform. And I am deeply grateful to be a part of the community and look out into this crowd. I look at you, you look like me, and I feel good all over. Ah. So Reverend Sharpton, and I happen to be over there at Canaan. Is that your church, that YT Walker? <laughs> <laughs> One of the freedom fighters, the guy who was with the late, great Martin Luther King and who's been pushing all along. I was delighted, honored, and privileged to be in this church where Nelson Mandela was there. And um, Nelson Mandela is trying to get us to bring a big event down to South Africa, which we will do. And we will try to spotlight that nation that's on the democratic regime. And you're talking about a true miracle. That's one right before your eyes. <laughs> Twenty-seven years in incarceration and come out and rule a country that had him in jail. That's good. Stuff. That's God. So I'm very happy to be here tonight, and I certainly enjoyed Bishop Huey. Oh, didn't he have some magic in him tonight? Yes, it was electric spark in this man this evening, and it was only divinity, divine right because everybody in here was just standing up and shaking and shouting and moving and twisting and turning. They couldn't, it, it was so good, they just couldn't keep it to themselves. <laughs> so I'm gonna take this National Action Network salute and I'm gonna treasure it because the thought and the spirit behind it is really what really motivates me and, and continues to make me fight and carry the bloodstained banner because I know that 
Jesus is on my side. I'm God's child. And there is no way that I can continue to do what I do and rise above the insurmountable difficulties and obstacles and impediments in my path if it was not for heat. The man who sits high and looks low and keeps his eye on the sparrow. You know, and I'm, I'm one of his children and I shall continue to persevere in spite of, not because of. And I just want to say that I just seen what some of my God children's report cards. And they had all eight. Did you see them? Well, all of these. That Reverend Chop and that this is Dominique and Ashley. Both of them got got great report cards, and I'm just as proud of them as I can be. So I'm gonna give each one of them fifty dollars for their report card, and don't you take it, Rev. <laughs> this ain't for Rev. You know what I mean? This is for them. Put it in their little account. Let them learn to let them keep some in their account, Rev. You know because. Oh, and he is hard. <laughs> I thank each and every one of you. God bless each and every one of you. And in, name, in the name of the Lord, let us go. I'm going to have Dr. Jones give Don my report card and see how much I get on the way up. We're going to go back into a question and answer period. We want to limit this now to the subject matter. This is not an open whatever you want to talk about. Drive time comes on at 7 in the morning. <laughs> 6. So that's when they have open mic. This is not open mic. This is on the matter we're discussing. Where's Dr. Jones? Reverend Crockett, we're happy to have Reverend Crockett with us for a moment. <laughs> Somebody give me those to go. <laughs> All right, now, you that have questions. No, 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 we, we do this work, this is Bethany, this is, we're going to do a question, we're going to limit the questions now to the subject matter to be presided by Dr. Jones. Let me say this as you form the line, and we're not going to do this all night. When Mike Tyson joined the church in Cleveland, the preacher that Sunday morning was our pastor, Dr. William Jones. Crockett, when he got baptized, Reverend uh, Jackson went out there. Now, see, I did the reverse. I got baptized by Dr. Jones. Maybe if Mike had done the reverse, it would have been a little different. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> but I'm very happy that uh, Don King again looked out for the community this year, those that needed to be fed. Give them another hand. All right, Dr. Jones is now talking. All right, now, you know, this, this is the house that Bill Jones built. And uh, I preside and decide in this house. Amen. And the penalty for rebellion against constituted authority is you know what. Now, all of you who have questions, uh, raise uh, before any of our presenters, I want you to stand now. All right, uh, look, come close. Uh, what mic are they going to use, Elsie? Uh... Now, I'm going to put a time limit on this. Uh, we didn't come here to stay all night. Uh, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. If you haven't uh, conceptualized by now, don't worry about it, you won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, uh, young lady, use that microphone, that's all right. Now the rest of you, come down, everybody who has a question, just come down and get in that line. That's beautiful, not too many. All right, go right ahead. Who, who do you address your question to?
spirit of the resolution is sound because the present images that adorn our homes and churches, as you said, stated, are inaccurate. The Europeanized view of the Holy Family and of a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus is the result of a happenstance when Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel. He needed a uh, model for the Holy Family, and his uncle's wife had just had a new baby upstairs, so he went upstairs and got them to pose. So it is a mistaken and misrepresentation of history. It's a matter of us deciding to, to have images that look like us. I was in Korea about two weeks ago, and some of the churches there, they have a Jesus who looks like Koreans look. And that's sound theology. Jesus is whatever you need him to be. I might uh, drop a footnote here. When, when this structure was built, when it was completed in 1977, no, 1967. I've been here too long. Uh, <laughs> But uh, when we were building, uh, I directed the stained glass artist to do all of the images in people of color. You won't find that here in Bethlehem. Next question. Jesus is simply the Greek form of the Hebrew, Yehoshua. Yeah. Uh, why? Yeah, yeah the, Dr. Jones has already given you a clue. Uh, at the time of uh, the historical Jesus, the Mediterranean world had been Hellenized, and Greek was the language. And so to refer to this person, he was known as Jesus Ha Christos. Jesus the Christ. Now, we say Jesus Christ in a colloquial uh, contraction, but it's really appropriate theologically to say Jesus the Christ because Christ is the past participial form of the word creo, creiri, which means to smear, and he is the one anointed of God. So the attempt was to describe Christ as the smeared one of God. So it's merely an appellation. Now, when you get to us and about our names, see, it, it, it doesn't really, in my view, make much difference whether you take the name of the person who bought you or the man who sold you. The Arabs were the slave traders and still are down on the Arabian Peninsula. You got to be known by something. If you want to take a number, you run out of numbers. But this is the name we've operated on. My, my, my grandmother was a slave. And my father, my name is Walker because the last farm that my father worked at was the Walker place and they called him the Walker boy. So it's a happenstance. But most of you who know me know that I'm Y.T. Walker. All right, sir.
specific question. says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, and by his stripes you heal. Uh, next question. The second advent of Jesus, and Dr. Walker was very correct when he said that it's not a question of what was he, but what is he. Jesus is indeed coming back, the second advent of the Lord, and uh, his hair like lamb's wool, so you're not that very far off. And the main thing we want to keep in our mind as we continue to discuss this is that we do recognize his blackness, and we can be proud of the fact that uh, in a spiritual way, and we can't forget that because not only was he a natural man, he was a spiritual man. And he said, Beloved, now we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Frederick. Yeah. 
gentlemen, this instance happened to all men. These gentlemen were well beloved in the communities, in the religious community, and Dr. Carr, of course, in the academic community, would it be feasible for the man to address, to, to approach the various religious conferences and, you know, starting at first things first and see if they can get them, the, the, the various churches, to remove the white community and Jesus from the church. Yeah, that, that would be feasible, Brother Fresh. It's uh, no question about it. Uh, anybody want to speak to that in the panelists? They're in agreement with you. Uh, there's no, no, no problem. Yes, sir. times while you ask the question. Come on, Wyatt. Yeah, when I heard you say tithes and offering, I knew that was me. In order? A command. No. A command. Yeah, it, 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 it. A command. It, 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 it is a, a command and a mandate of the biblical tradition, beginning with Abraham who paid tithes to Melchizedek in the era of the Chaldees. Uh, in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you will find frequent references to paying the tithes and bringing an offering. The, uh, the, the, the classic scripture is in Malachi, of course, 3 and 8. And the interesting thing that in that small book of the minor prophets a lot of us have missed the context of what the prophet was talking about Israel had again turned away from God by their idolatrous behavior and it's curious that in the, the initial step for them to be uh, harmonized with the will of God was to bring their tithes into offering that was the first the second thing I'll, let me finish now uh, is that there are some people who say we are New Testament Christians and tithing is Old Testament. My response is, so is thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not bear <laughs> false witness and thou shalt not commit adultery. That's Old Testament too. Right. We're not going to throw away the Old Testament because we are children of the new dispensation. And if God required of the old covenant for them to pay tithes and offering, we who are children of grace, should we do any less because, Je because God sent Jesus down the pipe? Well, uh, the one, 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 very quickly, very quickly, sir, Greece transcends law. Uh, and, and for this reason, I personally not only tithe, I have to go beyond the tithe. The tithe is the floor, not the ceiling. And one of the reasons I tithe and do more than tithe is because I got to get rid of this to make way for the other that's on the way. Thank you. Next question. Next question. Yeah. Yes. My name is George Henry Richardson. I'm pastor at the temple. I can say that you don't have Caucasian images in our church. Amen. Amen. It has been determined historically proven that the word of Jesus Christ is that African and anthropological orientation. It is also accepted that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for the first Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 3 through 9, rose from the dead, and is alive on another level of existence which we commonly call heaven. My question The Bible which Jesus now occupies, irrespective of previous orientation and what's the matters, could be classified as what, and what, if anything, should a human being of any racial group do to receive or be assured of being such a body. 
For the Bible says this, if that same spirit be in you that was in Christ Jesus, it shall also quicken your mortal body. And it goes further to say that if this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have another building of God, not made with hands, but eternal in the heaven. But God shall change our vile bodies like unto his own glorious body. So the way to do that is to repent, believe, be baptized, and be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that same spirit that was in Christ Jesus shall quicken you. Good question. Now, this line keeps growing. Uh, Mr. What's your name? Well, Brother Rudolph, you're the last one. All right. Okay. All right. All right, sir. Yes. Hello. My name is David. Uh, I was formerly a vendor at Huntsman Christian until we were uh, roughly uh, disbanded. I can't speak for Harlem, uh, but it's an awful indictment. It's an awful indictment. And uh, I, think, I think the answer is implicit in the question. Next. We certainly should celebrate Christmas. I hold no brief against Christmas trees and wreaths and lights, but if we could keep focus that it is the birthday of the Lord Jesus. Now we have been corrupted by the uh, mercantile interests with their invention of this fellow called Santa Claus. And somehow we've got to find enough maturity in the faith community to understand that it is no violation of our parental uh, responsibility to tell our children that there is no Santa Claus. Amen. Christmas is the birthday of Jesus Christ. Now, my good friend, Malana Karenga, has created this uh, alternate celebration of Kwanzaa which is catching on, and I think it is a suitable celebration for people of African ancestry and those who are interested in that. 
And in some way, it may help to neutralize the over-commercialization of the Christmas time. But the central point is that Christmas is a celebration that God thought enough of us to send Jesus into the world to save us from our sins. to your question, should we celebrate Christmas? We certainly should because of the fact of the person of Jesus Christ, not in the accoutrements that go around the holiday. Jeremiah says they chopped down a tree and took it to their house and idolized it. But we do not make a tree a God. Jesus died on a tree and he is the light of the world. So we don't have to idolize it or make it a God. So we celebrate it as the birth date of Jesus and the 25th is not necessarily proven to be the date. But the essence of it, whether it's spring or winter, Jesus is a God of all seasons. Now, Nick, now you raise questions. We got other people waiting. Say what? Dr. Clark, he mentioned several books. Alvin Boyd Q, K-H-U-N. Who is this King of Glory? That's his second, second title. Shadow of the Third Century. That's the other book. And by the way, concerning symbols and Christmas tree, nothing but symbol. A symbol is an idea objectified, which means that the symbol draws its significance from the idea that is conveyed. So when you look at a symbol, you've got to raise the question, what is the idea that it is giving expression to? My dear. December is mere symbol. The important thing is that history has been punctuated by his presence. That's the main thing. The important thing is that he came this way and nothing has been the same since. Thank you. Next. Yes. I can uh, gather the information to prove that 
country. I have a reference here from Herodotus, who is probably the first historian, and uh, I had it here somewhere, but in the works of Herodotus, in uh, book two, I think it's page 87, he describes the people of Kemet as being black. Uh, Dr. Clark earlier has mentioned St. Augustine. The Catholic Church for the last 20 years finally admitted that Augustine was an indigenous African, as were 10 of the 14 most prominent uh, church fathers who were responsible for laying the groundwork of what we know as the basis of our doctrine and theology in Christendom today. Origin, Tertullian, Cyprian, and of course the most famous is of course St. Augustine who wrote De Kiwitatis Dei, the city of God, which is the fundamental basis for almost all Roman Catholic theology. He was a black man. So there is a lot of external and internal evidence in the literature and church history of that period from 100 AD to 313 AD, I think that's the date that Dr. Clark used, which describes the people of Egypt as being black in color. Well, let me, let, me, let me be self-serving and mention to you one of my recent books, Afrocentrism and Christian Faith. You'll find some details in there. Afrocentrism and Christian Faith. Yes. wouldn't matter at all, except what someone made it matter and oppressed an entire people because they made it matter. The color factor did not start with us. We have no definition of race in our vocabulary. In our Look, all right, if it doesn't matter, if you ha he's had a 500 year period of whiteness. So, okay, don't slip him into blackness right away. It doesn't matter, let's have him green for a few <laughs> hundred years. That's just awesome. Just slip him into black after that. If the color of Christ is one color, the color of the cop on the beach on the beat is the same color. The color of the person teaching your child is the same color. It matters because the image controls the mind. The price is the same color of the policeman. 
It matters. Every society in the world paints the deity to resemble themselves. When I was 23 years old, I did a short story called The Boy Who Painted Christ Black. The story has been published and republished throughout the world. The boy painted Christ to resemble his father, and the principal in the school got fired for defending his right to do so. In Indonesia, the Buddha is Indonesian. In China, he's Chinese. In Japan, he's Japanese. Nobody is fighting over how he should look. But each person paints him to suit themselves with no argument and no fight. Like, take it or leave it. Don't like my Buddha? Shame on you. Go home and paint the one you want. Now, all of that translated simply means it matters. It really do matter. <laughs> all right, sir. All right, I would like to say that our people really do suffer from the lack of knowledge. And tonight, the beautiful scholars here passed on a lot of knowledge. All right. My question is, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's give our panelists another big hand, all of them.